Father George Appleyard, currently the pastor at Holy Trinity Ukrainian Catholic Church in Carnegie, Pennsylvania. And I want to welcome you to this episode of Kairos, God's Time, the study of the iconography, the artistic depiction of the great mysteries of faith that we use to help us in our ascent to God in our quest to share the divine nature. And today we're going to explore perhaps the most important of all the icons, the icon of the resurrection. Church creeds tell us that we believe that Christ had taken flesh of the Virgin Mary, that he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, that he died, that he was buried, that he rose again on the third day and returned to sit at the right hand of the Father. Those are all episodes in one great plan that brings about our salvation, our ultimate well-being. The resurrection itself has two scenes to it. That the Lord Jesus descended among the dead. That's what we mean by his burial. His physical body in the tomb, his human soul in the realm of the dead, while his divine nature remained enthroned with the Father. In the morning of the third day, women came to the tomb planning to embalm the body of the Lord Jesus. But before they ever arrived there, there was an earthquake. The stone rolled back from the mouth of the tomb to find it empty. Very important that we start with that. No one saw the Lord Jesus walk physically out of the tomb. Our four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all report that the Easter dawn experience was that of an empty tomb. It was not a vision of Jesus walking out of the tomb. Well, how then can we depict the resurrection? Well, there are two ways to do it. One is to show the women arriving at the empty tomb. The other, which is the preferred way in the Byzantine church, is to show Jesus in the underworld actually accomplishing the destruction of death. Depending on the way you prefer to look at the work of Jesus, either his sacrificial death on the cross, more prominent in Western Christianity, or his destroying of death, more prominent in Byzantine Christianity, you would prefer one or another image. Today we're going to explore that Byzantine image of Jesus destroying death by his death. We might express it this way. When Adam let go of God's hand, he slid from divine communion into a state that eventually brought him to the underworld. Poor Adam could not climb back to God. It was simply beyond his reach. Someone had to come to Adam, grasp him by the hand, and pull him out of the pit into which he had fallen. And so in the Byzantine church, we tend to picture that great moment when Jesus arrives in the underworld and takes Adam by the hand. Adam is now going to be lifted back to where he used to be, and with him, the whole human race. Now the image of this great event is normally portrayed by a glorious Lord Jesus standing in mandorlas of light and in this icon grasping Adam with one hand and Eve with the other. The scripture tells us in Paul's letter to the Romans just as sin had come into the world through one man and sin brought death, so also we are lifted by Jesus. One man brings resurrection. That you find in Corinthians. Through one man, resurrection of the dead occurs. So here is the basis of it. Jesus rescuing Adam and Eve from the underworld. 
And that is portrayed by this deep black abyss, the Hebrew notion of Sheol, the underworld. Now, in many of the icons, there is a picture of death itself portrayed as an old man, and he's tied up and chained, and he's lying in the darkness of his own making because he has been vanquished by Jesus Christ. This image is taken from the letter to the Hebrews. In the second chapter at about the 14th verse, the author says that Jesus shared the same things we share, our human condition, except sin. That through his death, he would bring to naught, he would annihilate the one who had power to cause death, in other words, the devil, to set free all those who were the victims of slavery all life long because of their fear of death. One of the things Jesus does for a believer is wipe out the fear of dying. A few minutes ago, I mentioned Paul's letter to the Romans, that death came into the world through one man, and because of death, sin. And then, because of death, death itself passes to all people. It's contagious because it causes people to sin. Sigmund Freud, Carl Jung, the other great psychologists, of course, have taught us so much about this, understanding it. When we are afraid of death, we will do things that are morally destructive. If we have a nihilistic attitude and we come to believe that what we know in this world is all there is, well, then you want all you can get. You do not postpone pleasure. You do not make sacrifices for others because you want not just your share, you want all you can get. We see this in some instances when people become exceedingly selfish and self-centered. It's gimme, 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 me, mine. This quest for my rights without a sense of mutual responsibility, of some kind of concern for each other. In other words, without any reference to a plan, a process, greater than life as we know it in this world. And so in the icon, death is pictured as a man, the one who out of envy brought us to ruin, and he is now held captive. Jesus is standing on what looks like an X here. These are two bronze doors, two bronze doors. They are the doors or the gates of hell. Jesus had promised in his preaching that he would establish a church, a community, and that the bronze gates of hell would not be able to keep it out. Well, the church is his own body, and Jesus goes there first. Even if we must sojourn in death for a little while, nonetheless, the doors aren't locked. It's simply a passageway. So here is the Lord Jesus standing on these gates, which he has literally kicked down. And he's pulling Adam and Eve out of their sepulchers, out of their graves. Perhaps the next dominant image is the circle of light, or I should say, the three circles of light. For in most icons, you see that there are three different shades of celestial color. Here, we are indebted to something St. Paul said in trying to explain an ecstasy that he himself had, we're sure. He said that he was taken up to the third heaven, the ultimate heaven, the highest heavens. And so depending on your images of the heavenly spheres, your cosmology as we call it, you might paint it differently. But here at least it suggests that what we have is the portal into heaven. Jesus Christ, again, he is the way, he is the gate, the gate into everlasting life. There's a host of figures standing around. 
Now, in the two icons I'm working with today, just slightly different. To begin with, in this icon, there is a man standing at the Lord Jesus' right hand. And it's clear from the way he is pictured that it's John the Baptist. In our tradition, we make a lot of John's role, not just in the world, pointing out the Lamb of God, but being executed before Jesus finished his ministry, John himself descended to the underworld and preached to people there, the Savior is on his way, the Messiah is coming, he has appeared. So John becomes the first overture of hope and joy to those held captive in Hades, in the underworld. In this particular icon, it's not John. In this icon, it's a prophet. You can tell by the scroll he's holding. Perhaps Isaiah, pointing to the suffering servant who has been vindicated by God. Next to him are two figures wearing royal crowns. One is David the prophet, the other is Solomon the prophet. These, of course, are the royal forebears of Jesus. He inherits their throne, and he occupies it forever. One might also see in this a line from Easter Sunday evening, from the Acts of the Apostles, where the two disciples on their way to Emmaus, meeting the risen Jesus and not recognizing him at first, nonetheless had this heartwarming experience when the Lord Jesus ex explained that Christ had to suffer according to the law and the prophets and thus enter his glory. So here is both, one might say, law and prophet beside the risen Jesus. On the other side, there is one figure in almost all icons. He's shown here, and at the same time he's shown here. This is Abel, Abel, the first person to die a death. According to the story in the book of Genesis, Abel was slaughtered by his brother Cain out of jealousy. And so Abel the shepherd, who offered a lamb to God that made Cain envious, is shown with his shepherd's staff, Abel the just, the first of Eve's children to experience death in the fallen world. Other saints are pictured. In this particular icon here, the two royal saints are on the Lord's left and other figures to his right. They are not identified. In many icons, especially bigger ones, the iconographer will write the name of the person depicted so we know exactly who it is that we're looking upon. Some other things that may not be apparent at first. There is a strange similarity between the layout of this icon of the resurrection and an icon of the baptism of Jesus. In the icon of the baptism of Jesus, he would be shown in the center between two mountains, just as here, and John would be conferring the baptism, and instead of the Old Testament patriarchs and saints, would be a few angels ministering to the Lord. And of course, the center would be the River Jordan flowing down this way. One could almost superimpose an icon of the resurrection on type of an icon of the baptism of the Lord. And there's a reason for that. The similarity, I believe, is purposeful. After all, Paul says in his letter to the Romans, when we were baptized into Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. In other words, we went into the tomb with him and joined him in death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the Father's glory, we too might live a new life. So in a and an icon of the baptism, the Lord Jesus would be descending into the waters, symbolic of his approaching physical death, his atoning death. But in this icon, he's going in the other direction. He's coming up. He's coming up from the very bottom of the world as it was known. 
Now, the mountains. Again, the background here is interesting. It's a very bleak kind of landscape. The mountains don't show any kind of vegetation. They're, they're very barren. They're very dry. This, it seems, is a reference to the book of Jonah the prophet. At the very beginning of the book of Jonah, and it's read or prescribed to be read in the Byzantine Paschal Vigil, the prophet Jonah describes going down headlong into the breaches of the mountains. A little hard to translate exactly. One could say perhaps the roots of the mountains or, or the, the fissures, the chasms of the mountains. Nonetheless, the prophet describes himself in the person of Jesus, we would say, going down into death going down into the underworld, and that underworld is located in the bases of the mountains, the very center of the world. In Jonah's canticle, he says, I went down headlong into the splits of the mountains. I went down into the earth, whose bars are everlasting barriers. And so here is Jesus down in the splits of the mountains, in the, the roots of the mountains, at the very bowels of the world, the great abyss, and now he is rising. There is no way to explain how Jesus comes up. Yes, he's standing on the gates, but they too seem to be floating. All the power is in his person. He pulls up Adam, the first human being, and Eve, the mother of all the living, but no one pulls him up. It's innate to him. It is his divinity asserting itself in his humanity and bringing him up from the underworld. What more shall we say about the icon of the Lord's resurrection? When you and I look at it, we do not see the perspective in a linear way. That is, the action is sometimes going in one direction, sometimes going in another direction, and they're superimposed. So while we might be expecting the gate of heaven to be painted above the Lord Jesus, it's painted behind the Lord Jesus. In many other icons, especially of saints, there will be a little corner as though the artist had rolled back the canvas and paints the heavenly realm, often with a hand coming down out of it to show the communion of that saint with, with God in Christ. But not in the icon of the resurrection. Here, the Lord Jesus is standing, and it's on our level now. It's not above us. It's on our level. We're standing facing in, face to face, this portal, this entryway into a new way of life. Let's turn for a few minutes and consider the theology that drives the Byzantine church in its understanding of this event. Again, it is not that one tradition is particularly right or wrong. That's not the case. It's rather one tradition might emphasize something, put much more importance on certain details. Another tradition sees the story a little differently. As the creed says, we all believe that Jesus suffered, died, was buried, rose, went back to the Father. Now, the Byzantine church obviously commemorates the death of the Lord Jesus and commemorates his resurrection, but puts most of its emphasis on this event in the underworld because for the Byzantine church, the destruction of death is the linchpin as we see the plan of salvation, the destruction of death. Why? Let's go back to St. Paul's letter to the Romans again. In the fifth chapter, there is a sentence very difficult